Okay, so this is part one for the female reproductive system. Uh, female reproductive system has a lot of similarities to the male reproductive system. Uh, their primary sex organs are the ovaries, and the ovaries are there to produce the gametes, so the sex cells, which are the eggs for the females, and the ovaries also produce hormones. Secondary sex organs, uh, we have internal and external accessory sex organs. We'll talk about those. Transverse section of the feta of the female um, pelvic cavity. Um, this is more just to give you a reference for where, um, say, the bladder, the uterus, rectum, and um, ureters all are all oriented together. All right, ovary attachments. <clears throat> the ovaries, um, in general, the ovaries are small, uh, like three and a half centimeters long, uh, two centimeters wide, and then about a centimeter around, or a centimeter thick, I should say. And they're found in the lateral walls of the pelvic cavity. Uh, their descent is similar to the testes, although though obviously they don't descend as far. Uh, there's a broad ligament, um, and the broad ligament holds uh, holds the ovaries in place. The broad ligament is just a, a fold of the peritoneum, but it also contains lots of blood vessels and nerves for the ovaries. Um, suspense, uh, suspensory ligament um, is smaller and it just holds the superior end of the ovaries. Um, it's also a place though where blood vessels and nerves can pass through. And the ovarian ligament, which is actually part of the broad ligament, but it's just a thickening there, um, holds the inferior end of the ovaries to the uterus. Okay, follicles. Um, so, follicles actually start, or I should say the eggs actually start to develop before the female baby is even born. So, while the baby's still in the womb, um, these cells called oogenia, which, let's see. This pen is very rudimentary, O-O. Um, gonia. Okay, O-O gonia undergo something called oogenia, oogenius. Um, and the oogonia are there to, just to produce more oogonia. So that's their function. They go through mitosis and produce exact copies of themselves. Eventually the oogonia develop into primary oocytes through meiosis. Um, the primary oocytes have this layer of um, follicular cells and so the follicular cells along with um, back over here, the follicular cells along with the primary oocyte form this primordial follicle. Okay, so the follicular sites, follicular cells with the primary oocyte form the primordial follicle, which are these really small things. Um, women, uh, when they're born, they have about a half million of these primordial follicles. But by the time they reach puberty, they only have about 10% of that left. And then over the course of their reproductive life, they're only going to release 400 to 500. All right, oogenesis. Um, and this is what, this is happens, so, or I should say resumes when puberty. So oogenesis resumes when puberty starts and the meiosis can restart. And the primary oocyte will go through meiosis 
Um, so here's that primary oocyte. It's going to go through meiosis and result in, you get one good egg um, here, one good egg with, um, which is the secondary oocyte. And then you're going to get one or two or even randomly sometimes three polar bodies. So the secondary oocyte will develop. Now the polar bodies are much smaller. They don't have as much cytoplasm because the secondary oocyte has to bring um, a lot of cytoplasm and a lot of organelles. So the, or many organelles, so that um, when it's fertilized, the egg will have something to grow with because for fertilization, the sperm really only brings its chromosomes. It's not going to bring anything else to the party. It's just going to be the sperm showing up with its chromosomes, knocking on the door and being like, hey, here I am. Um, and so the secondary oocyte really has to have all the stuff to begin life. Follicle maturation. Um, so at puberty, these primordial follicles are going to mature um, into primary follicles. And the, well, one of the biggest triggers for this is the increased FSH, the follicular or follicle stimulating hormone. Cells continue to develop um, and mature into antral follicles. Now the antral follicles um, take about 300 days from the primordial follicle to the antral follicle um, forming. And only one of those antral follicles, the dominant one, will, is released. So it's an ongoing process in the ovary from going from primordial follicle to antral follicles. And then they, the the biggest, the dominant antral follicle is the one that gets released, and that gets released about every 28 days. Okay. And this is ovulation. Ovulation is when that primary oocyte, um, or I'm sorry, the secondary oocyte gets released, um, but it's released from the ovary as a secondary oocyte, but allow that follicular fluid um, and it's released, now it's not released directly into the uterine tube, but it's released in the area and the uterine, true, uterine tube um, can accept it. And we'll talk about these female internal accessory organs. Uterine tubes, um, you have, uh, uh, uterine tubes are also called the fallopian tubes. That's the name most of us grew up with. Uh, also, oviducts is another name for them. And they're, um, they're going to connect the area around the ovary with the uterus. And so it's about 10 centimeters-ish long and allows the egg to go from the ovary into the uterus. The infundibulum is this expanded end of the uterine tube. Um, and the fimbra are these extensions, and they help guide the egg into the uterine tube. The lining of the uterine tube, so the, it has the outer layer, which is the peritoneum, the middle muscular layer, which creates these peristal, peristaltic, waves, peristaltic waves, and then you have the inner mucosal layer that have these cilia. And the cilia help to propel the egg towards the uterus, so it's kind of always constantly beating towards the uterus, along with the um, peristaltic waves from the muscle layer. And fertilization will occur in the uterine tube. All right, uterus. Uterus functions to receive that fertilized egg. So the egg gets fertilized, say, somewhere in here, and make its way to the uterus. If the egg starts to develop implants in the uterine tube and starts to develop in there, you get something called an ectopic pregnancy, which is dangerous. Um, and, um, the fetus can't grow in there. 
um, uterus. So I was about seven, uh, seven to nine, seven to ten centimeters long, five centimeters wide, and about two and a half centimeters in diameter. And that's for the non-pregnant woman, obviously. The upper part is called the fundus. It's this upper expanded part where the uterine tubes enter. And the lower part is called the cervix. Okay. And the lower part is obviously more um, more narrow. Three, way, three layers of the uterine wall. You've got the parametrium, the myometrium, and the endometrium. The endometrium and the myometrium undergo a lot of um, changes over the monthly cycle for a woman, and the endometrium gets sloughed off. All right. The vagina... Uh, vagina is the one that's 9 to 12 centimeters long. It's a muscular tube, um, receives the penis and um, sperm, and allows the baby to pass through. Intermucosal layer, you know, it's called the intermucosal layer, but there's actually no mucus glands in there. All the mucus from the vagina comes from the cervix and from the vaginal orifice. Middle muscular layer. The middle muscular layer has um, longitudinal fibers and circular fibers with some striated fibers near the vaginal orifice. Outer fibrous layer connects the vagina to the surrounding organs. So the outer fibrous layer um, helps to hold the vagina in place. Okay. Female external reproductive organs, labia majora, uh, similar to the scrotum, and closes and protects the other external organs. Um, it's also a place where you have glands and hair. Um, there's a uh, thickening and with more subcutaneous fat over the symphysis pubis. It's called the mons pubis. Labia minora. Um, anteriorly forms the clitoral hood, lots of blood vessels in here. Uh, the clitoris is, um, is similar to the penis and it has those two columns of erectile tissue called the corpora cavernosa and um, the clitoris has lots of nerve fibers in it. It's about two centimeters by um, 0.5 by 2 centimeters by a half centimeter. This flow chart shows the erection, lubrication, and orgasm for the woman. It starts with sexual stimulation, and then you get the parasympathetic. Notice this is very similar to the males. Parasympathetic nervous system from the sacral portion of the spinal cord. Um, you get dilation of arteries in those corpora cavernosa. Um, and um, vagina, both become engorged and swollen. Um, sexual stimulation intensifies. Vestibular glands secrete mucus, additional mucus to lubricate, and then um, you get orgasm, which is similar to uh, those peristaltic waves. Um, Muscular contraction of the uterus and uterine tubes contract and the help to accept the sperm and deliver it. Uh, hormonal control of the female reproductive system. So the big ones are the estrogens. Um, the estrogens, excess or additional estrogens help to inhibit the luteinizing hormone and the follicle stimulating hormones during most of the reproductive cycle. So those estrogens help to keep those from being released. Estrogens also, and this is kind of a review from endocrine system, but the estrogens um, develop breasts and ductile, system, ductile systems of the mammary glands. You get that increased adipose tissue. So this, all this stuff, we're, I'm going to go over in the next 
slide, but I just wanted you to have this so you can look at it while we talk about this. So, female reproductive system. Um, the anterior pituitary is the one that releases luteinizing hormone and follicle stimulating hormone. So these are what stimulate these follicles to, to develop, um, go from those primordial follicles into those antral follicles. Um, especially the follicle stimulating hormone, which is a nice coincidence since that's its name. Uh, the granuloso cells from the follicles release um, or secrete lots of estrogens. And then the estrogens, so follow this, estrogens are causing, as this estrogen goes up, it causes the uterine lining, um, that endometrium, to thicken and become more vascular. The luteinizing hormone um, surge, which is this one right here, is what actually stimulates the ovulation to occur. So the um, secondary oocytes can be released with all that follicular fluid. Um, after ovulation, the corpus luteum takes over and secretes a lot of estrogens and progesterone. The corpus luteum is just the remnants from that follicle, and they secrete lots of estrogen. <sighs> Those estrogen, that increased estrogen and progesterone causes the uterine lining to keep thickening um, and you get even more vascularization, which is depicted here. They also keep the luteinizing hormone and the follicle stimulator hormone, um, they inhibit it, so it's the anterior pituitary can't release it. The corpus luteum, though, if there's no, um, if there's no, What's that called? Fertilization. The corpus luteum will begin to break down and won't secrete the estrogens and progesterone. And that can't support, without the estrogens and progesterone, you can't support this lining anymore. And the lining will just disintegrate and slough off um, and be expelled from the woman's body. And then without these estrogens and progesterone, the anterior pituitary is no longer inhibited and can release the luteinizing hormone and follicle stimulating hormone. All right. Menopause uh, usually occurs in the 40s or 50s. That's when the reproductive cycle stops. Perimenopause is when it's disrupted. Ovaries aren't going to produce their hormones anymore. They're not going to release follicles anymore. Or we're not going to release oocytes anymore. Um, you know, there is hormone therapy to help with the effects on bone tissue, but there's also, um, those could also have effects on, um, other effects, unwanted effects, and sometimes it's been associated with cancer. Mammary glands, these are the glands that lie over, and they're kind of these, um, not not all homologous uh, glands that lie over the pec major muscle. You get 15 to 20 of these alveolar glands and that produce this, the milk and the alveolar glands um, drain into the alveolar ducts which then drain into the lactiferous ducts which then drain into the nipple. Okay, areola is the darkening around the nipple. Okay, types of birth control, all the information's right here. Coitus interruptus is um, it was also called the withdrawal method, so when the man withdraws before he ejaculates. Rhythm method is when you try to time um, your um, sexual activities so that you not doing it when the woman is ovulating or just after the woman is ovulated. Mechanical barriers, condoms, diaphragms, cervical caps, spermo, spermo, um, spermicidal foams and jellies. They're mechanical in that the sperm gets stuck to them and they can't move, but the spermicides are also chemical in that they kill the sperm. Oral contraceptives, there's hormonal, 
We also have injectable ones that can be long-term, contraceptive implants long-term, IUDs um, are long-term methods, uh, surgical meth methods, vasectomies and tubal ligations. So <clears throat> vasectomies are when the those vas deferens are cut um, and with uh, with tubal ligations is when the uterine tubes are cut. And both of these um, both of these are, are reversible, but the tubal ligations are not as reversible. You know, they could be, but it's harder. These are reversible. And um, the vasectomies is less invasive, can be done from the outside, uh, going through the scrotum. Tubal ligations, you know, it's a it's a surgery. So you know, if you had to, if you didn't want to have kids anymore, as a couple, this would be the way to go because it's not as major of a surgery. And it's more reversible if you decide later on, hey, we want to have more kids for whatever reason. Not sure why you would do that. All right, sexually transmitted diseases. Um, are generally silent infections and in that most people don't even know they have them. Most are bacterial and can be cured with antibiotics. Um, things like herpes simplex, warts, um, acquired immune deficiency syndrome are all viral and they can't be cured. Um, some cause infertility, especially things like syphilis. Uh, AIDS can cause death, but so, so can syphilis if it's left untreated. Uh, symptoms, burning sensation during urination, pain in the lower abdomen, uh, fever, swollen glands, especially in the pelvic region, not the fever, but the swollen glands, um, a milky or thick discharge from the penis or vagina, sores, blisters, bumps, and rashes, and itchy, runny eyes. Mm. I'm always concerned with that one. Uh, clinical application, this goes back to the male reproductive system, but it's at the end of the PowerPoint. So prostate enlargement is, um, is uh, normal for men. Most men get it. Um, Risk factors, if you had a vasectomy, but this is not a huge risk factor. Um, fatty diets are a big one, but you know any man in his 50s um, is probably going to get a prostate enlargement.